Tool is one of the greatest rock bands of all time, and Adam Jones is a musical genius. Or at least that is what the internet tells me. I've never really listened to Tool, but whether you like Tool or not, the Adam Jones signature guitars are awesome. 70s Silver Burst Les Pauls. Look, they've got volutes. And this Adam Jones standard is the most hyped Gibson USA release since, well, probably since they streamlined the lineup back to the classic staples. And a lot of the hype is well deserved. There's a lot they got right with this. And also quite a bit I wish they had done differently. And I will explain how I got to that conclusion Let's take a closer look. So whenever I get a new piece of gear, I like to test it by writing something with it. It's a great shakedown run, test the different tones, the tuning stability, whether it's inspiring to play. And this being an Adam Jones signature guitar, I'm gonna try and write something in the style of Tool. Now I've only heard like one or two other songs once, and I've definitely not learned any of their riffs, so this might be a rough one for my power chord butt rock playing ass. My brothers in Christ, we need a miracle. Oh, you gotta love the vanilla smell of new Gibsons. I'm probably getting brain cancer, but you know, so worth it. All right, let's write some great value tool. Um. I don't know what Tool sounds like. <laughs> so I've asked Discord, Discord has given me a playlist, a crash course in Tool to listen to. So I'm gonna do a little bit of research right now. Fucking love my job, dude. Yeah, man, it was a hard day at work. I listened to a bunch of Tool. Okay, I've just listened to some Tool, and my key takeaway is, what the f is happening? Like, it doesn't seem super technical on the fingerboard, but what is going on with the timing? It grooves, and then it's got sections that just, it's very difficult to follow if you're trying to follow it. I've literally no idea where to start with this. It sounds like he uses a lot of But other than that, um, I am lost. Something I will say, uh, this thing plays so well. The neck is not what I was expecting. I was expecting super thin, like on my 72 and 74 Les Paul Customs. This is pretty chunky. That's a chunky sounding Les Paul, man. I wasn't too sure about this pickup, you know, not being a Seymour Duncan and what Adam Jones actually uses. But it's cool, I mean, it's super hot. Anyways, uh, let me ask Discord again for some help. Just make sure the song sounds like it's about to start for seven minutes, but never actually does. And then that wine which on Instagram says, breaking up four, four, or eight, eight beats into interesting subdivisions, like three, three, two for the intro to Fear Inoculum. It's four, four, but it doesn't feel four, four. Then really simple guitar riffs, but lots of atmosphere and groove. Exactly, this dude fucking nailed it. This person tools. Yeah, he's totally right. The riffs aren't necessarily super technically complicated, but when it comes to timing and arrangement, it's less of a tongue twister and more of a Shakespearean sonnet. And then six string J5 says, or a five or seven beat pattern, an even number of times adding a two beat fill when needed to fit in 4-4. Four, four. So kind of the same thing, but a different example. And if you're like me, not a theory person whatsoever, and that sounds super complicated, this dude breaks it down, just do some hammer-ons, <laughs> you'll be just fine. I've realized the only way that I'm gonna make this work is if I write the drums first, because my mind doesn't think in 5-4 or 7-8 or anything else besides 4-4 four, four butt rock, apparently. kind of got like a groove and then you have that rushed bar and then you're back to the groove. But better, um, hammer-ons. No, actually they like doing the... And I noticed sometimes Adam Jones bases his riffs around, um, let's call it an anchor note. So let's just call this our anchor note and then have everything around it palm muted. So... This is really, really difficult for me. Fuck. And then he uses a lot of big power chords, which I'm super excited about because I like the sound of this bridge. They do a lot of playing with it's on beat, then it's off beat, then it's on beat, then it's off beat. So you 
your daily reminder to practice. <laughs> That'll work. Baby's first tool riff. That's our main distorted riff sorted. We need a main clean riff now. This is cool by the way. The burst bucker, they reverse mounted it. And people do this because with the pole pieces closer to the bridge, like a bridge pickup, it's still warm because it's in the neck pickup position, but it's got a little bit more crispness, a little more brightness to it. So with this one, instead of going one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, I've taken the other dude's advice and uh, I've gone with a five beat. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one. All right, cool, we got that, and then that'll launch into the... Genuinely, right, I think this is the best playing Modern Gibson I've ever come across. But they've done a really, really good job with the fretwork. This is super nice. Like, even compared to the Slash Les Paul, which is the same price, this feels like a higher-end guitar. That could also be the Ebony board. I'm a sucker for Ebony. Honestly, a big thing from the tool I've listened to so far is repetition, so I think that's mostly enough. But I feel like I do need one more riff. Something like that big power chord out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, fuck it. That'll work. I think there are enough ideas there. I'm gonna go and work on the demo track off camera. Not entirely confident in how this is gonna turn out yet. Like, again, I'm not too familiar with the band, but I'll meet you back here for the final results. Interesting. I'm trying to analyze and replicate the style of an artist I'm not too familiar with, in this case Tool, it's always really fun. And this demo track, Tool Marks, as well as the tab being up on Patreon, is also scheduled to go up on Spotify right now. And I've done that with the help of today's sponsor, so let's take a quick second and thank DistroKid for sponsoring today's video. Look, guitars, new gear, it's always exciting, but the real exciting part is the music you create with it and sharing that music with the world. And DistroKid is the easiest way to get your music onto all the major platforms, Spotify, Apple Music, 
all the other ones that matter just as much. DistroKid takes all the hard work out of it. Uploading is just a few clicks. And if it's a cover, they'll even help get the license, which is massive. And a big reason as to why I and so many other people love and use DistroKid is because they're musician focused. They're constantly improving the service and adding features, evolving with the landscape to serve the modern artist. There's splits for all collaborators to get paid fairly, promo cards to advertise new releases on social media, social phone to communicate with your most loyal fans via text. One of my favorite features is being able to quickly get verified artist accounts through DistroKid like on Spotify and on YouTube. Not only is it cool to have that verified badge, but an official artist channel on YouTube also means you'll have additional tools like analytics for artists, and especially with all the scams going around YouTube right now, that badge is essential in letting your viewers know they're interacting with the real you. DistroKid doesn't take any cuts, all the revenue earned from your music is yours. Pricing starts at just 20 bucks a year for unlimited uploads, but for you guys, use my link in the description, you can snag a bonus discount. Plus it supports the channel by letting them know that I sent you, so if you got music to show the world, DistroKid is the way to do it. Huge fan of theirs, go check them out. And while you're doing that, here are my honest thoughts on the most hyped Gibson USA release of the year. Okay, so I know this isn't the same as an Adam Jones Les Paul Custom, and there's a lot of artificial differentiation here that I'm not a fan of. It's pretty uncool, but I really, really like this guitar. It's a Silver Burst Les Paul Standard with an ebony board, which is just awesome. And you'll hear me come back to this point a lot. It's like a hybrid Les Paul, a standard custom, because it's a teardrop Silver Burst too. Gibson has done non-custom Silver Burst before in limited runs, a lot of them were rimbers, which just, it, it's more silver on the top, but personally doesn't look as good as the OG design. I also like how the color's been aged a bit. It's starting to go a bit gold. And funny or special with this one, you can actually see the maple grain of the top through the finish, and it's got this cool ripple effect. It's especially noticeable near the control knobs, but it's all over the top. Like, it would seem this is a pretty well-figured piece of maple. Honestly, I don't know if this is a defect or not. I've never seen it on any other solid top finish before. I've checked other Adam Jones standards on eBay and on Reverb. This is the only one with figuring under the Silver Burst. And defect or not, I <laughs> think it looks really cool. It's unique. It'll help me identify mine if it gets stolen. <laughs> more personal taste input. I wish there was a little more green to the color like they had in all the promo pics of the custom shop runs. All the same, really cool they've used an aged teardrop silver burst on the standard so it looks like an Adam Jones model. At least it does from the front. Man, it would have been so cool if they'd taken all of the customs visual cues and applied them to the standard. You know, silver burst on the back and on the neck too, especially on the neck, that would have been awesome. But Gibson have not, they've done what they do for all the other non-custom silver bursts and gone with black. It's fine, it looks fine. Actually, I guess the custom artwork on the back of the headstock wouldn't have stood out as much on a lighter canvas, but still, man, a non-custom true silver burst front and back, that would have been so cool. Still though, it's a standard in silver burst with an ebony board, that's dope. And it's a 70s inspired Les Paul, so it's got the volute. Any Les Paul with a volute scores big points for me. Honestly, I don't know how effective it would be at preventing a break if I dropped this 11 pound monster on the ground headstock first. But if nothing else, it's nice to feel a point of reference on the neck. Speaking of the neck, I'm not sure how accurate this is to the Adam Jones custom shop signatures or the actual 1979 Les Paul custom they're based on. I know this non weight relieved body is definitely 70s inspired. It's about 11 pounds. It's heavy as shit. And I'm a big fan of that. That, by the way, I love heavy guitars. For some reason, it might just be in my head, but the chugs feel that much heavier. But back to the next, they aren't even the same wood for some reason. The customs have maple, this is mahogany. No idea why they decided to change that. Generally, I found maple to be more stable. For playing though, honestly with the gloss finish, can't feel a difference. So, material, not a big deal, but this neck 
doesn't feel like the neck on any of the Norlands that I've ever tried. Every Gibson I've picked up from this period, a 72 Les Paul Custom, a 74 Les Paul Custom, a 79 the Paul, two 81 Sonics's, they've all had really thin necks. I'm talking like ESP thin U necks. And that Norland neck shape is a huge part of why they're my favorite era of Gibson guitars. This Adam Jones standard has what Gibson is calling their 70s rounded neck profile. And it feels closer to the 50s rounded profile on the Slash standard than it does any of the Norland necks I've tried. Obviously, it's not as chonky as the 50s, but the shoulders have the same carve, and overall, it's got the same thickness as a 60s slim taper. So this profile is kind of a combo between those two, rather than the Norland profile I was expecting. And I thought that would be a deal breaker for me. I've been dying for Gibson to do more 70s stuff because of that neck shape. And I guess, sadly, I'm still waiting. But again, this is a Les Paul standard in silver burst with an ebony fingerboard. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, I was a bit worried when I got my Slash Collection standard. There were super visible tool marks everywhere on the fingerboard. It was like, oh no, are we going backwards? Then I got this, and um, yeah, it's also got a lot of tool marks on the fingerboard, so that's not great. Part of the nut has also been cut off somehow. <laughs> that's not great either. Then I started playing it. This is the best Les Paul standard I've ever tried. It's so easy to play. Obviously, it's not like playing a Strandberg, but if you love the chunkiness of a Les Paul like I do, this one, it's special. The only QC oddities I could find, the tool marks, the nut, excess wax at the pickups, all superficial things. Which leads us to the huge elephant in the room. What is up with the pickups in this Adam Jones signature guitar? <laughs> They're straight up just not the same pickups that Adam Jones uses. For reference, the customs come with a Seymour Duncan DDJ in the bridge, which is a hand-bound distortion humbucker, and then they have a reverse-mounted Alnico 3 Gibson custom bucker in the neck. This, meanwhile, has a Gibson DC high-gain humbucker in the bridge, which seems to be exclusive to this model, and a reverse-mounted Alnico 2 burst bucker 1 in the neck. And Gibson hasn't explained the spec difference at all, like they haven't said, hey, Adam Jones wanted a different sound for the standard, or he wanted this bridge pickup specially designed. Um, they've just been completely silent about it. There's other little spec differences. The Custom has a bone nut, this has graph tech, the Custom has Schaller tuners, this has Grover. I can kind of understand that. They've never explicitly said that this is a 1979 model. It's more of a modern day standard that's been Adam Jonesified. But the pickup choice is super bizarre. I mean, I understand. This is more wallet accessible than the $6,000 custom shop version, but this is still a $3,000 guitar. The fact they haven't even put a custom bucker in here, which is a Gibson pickup, it's just so bizarre. Add to that the Epiphone version launching sometime soon. That's confirmed to have Seymour Duncan. Again, just bizarre. All that being said though, this guitar sounds pretty damn good. Especially this DC high gain humbucker. It's super hot, super crunchy. <laughs> Legit, this is my new favorite Gibson pickup. Actually, I say that like it's a high bar or something. I generally don't like Gibson pickups. I really, really like this one. It might be a modified Dirty Fingers. Those were introduced in 1978 and would fit the vibe, but that's just a guess. Then the Burst Bucker, I mean, it does PAF things. And the Knurled Selector Tip is a really nice touch. So, I don't know how this sounds compared to the Custom. I don't have one to compare. I mean, I fucking wish though, right? I would guess the Alnico 3 Custom Bucker has a little more bite to it than the Alnico 2 burst bucker and that might match the hot ass bridge pickup better but you know what i just really like the way this guitar sounds
it's it's a silver burst standard with an ebony board super cool and if i haven't made it clear by now that's basically the deal with this guitar it's not cheap there are some bizarre spec choices i haven't even mentioned that it doesn't have the cool silver burst case or any sort of coa or any adam jones case candy at all actually that would have been nice but this is the best playing best sounding standard i have ever tried and it's in silver burst and it's got an ebony board so yeah that's about all i have to say about this guitar what about you what are you thinking about this gibson adam jones standard i have a feeling there's gonna be a lot of opinions in the comments about this one <laughs> a few of you have probably been eye sexing the Hafey Origins behind me. So here's your reminder, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications, that way you don't miss any new uploads from me. For that one, there may or may not be a guest cameo whose name rhymes with scat beefy. It's pretty epic, trust me, you'll want to watch that one. And massive shout out to all my amazing patrons. It's been a huge transition moving to the new studio and being a new dad and the support I've gotten while I've been trying to keep the content flowing, it's just, it, it's just been wonderful and very, very helpful. If you want to join them in supporting the content and get bonus extras, link will be in the description. We're also very, very close to the next Patreon goal, where we'll be upgrading everything to crispy 4K for even better content for you guys. Love this modern standard, but if traditional is more your taste, you'll be wanting to check out this video over here. In the meantime, as always, thank you so much for watching. You've been awesome, and I'll see you for the next video.